Okay, hey, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Mahan Hall, historic Mahan Hall. Welcome back to our Naval Academy alumni, our supporters. I want to give a special shout out to this fantastic group of Navy SEAL Special Operator Chief Warrant Officers who are here on a conference and have decided to come in and listen to uh, Vice Admiral Tin Seismansky. Um, my job here for you this afternoon, yeah, I'll give these guys a round of applause. This part of the program is really special. You have a chance to hear from one of our Navy senior leaders, something that's been in the special operations community for well over 30 years. So Tim Seismansky is from Willing Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, he went to the Naval Academy Prep School. And uh, I always like telling people when we have somebody that's been successful in the Navy, they started out at the Naval Academy Prep School. When he graduated here in 1985, he actually was a surface warfare officer first, did that for four years. And then he went on to uh, the basic underwater demolition school, graduated in class 161 in 1989. He's been a Navy SEAL going on there forward. If you were to look at his career, and of course, if you follow it and you go online and you look at what a Navy SEAL does, whether you follow it on Wikipedia or go on the official Navy biography website, you'll notice that they don't tell you much. <laughs> so I'm not gonna tell you much either, uh, except to say that Tim has commanded at every level and every aspect of SEALs teams, from special boats to uh, special uh, delivery vehicles, uh, to the uh, Warfare Development Group, uh, he went on to uh, serve not only in, in the joint staff at the J3 and the operations directorate, he has served on joint task forces for special operations in Afghanistan, uh, served as the deputy commander for joint task force special, op or excuse me, for the joint special operations command. Uh, and eventually he went on to just recently a job that he had where he was the head for all Navy special warfare out in Coronado, California as a two-star admiral. He's also been the detailer for all enlisted and officer, and include uh, all the special boat group and explosive ordnance disposal in Millington. Talk about a not fun job. <laughs> Have I got some orders for you? Uh, and he is our new, most newly promoted three-star admiral, having been promoted two Mondays ago, and now he serves as the deputy commander at U.S. Special Operations Command, one of our three functional uh, joint commands, and so he's down in Tampa, Florida. And uh, he's coming in here today to uh, take the stage for about an hour, talk to you a little bit. Uh, I'm sure he'll be able to take some questions. So ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Vice Admiral Tim Seismansky. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Hey, it is a pleasure to be here. Welcome, friends. I don't see too many midshipmen out there. Uh, and I did have a little bit of a message, but I can, I can flex uh, for the midshipmen here. Um, I think that the, this forum, this, this uh, call to serve, uh, dare to lead, is, is, a, is an important uh, epithet, if you will. And, uh, and so I'll come, I'll come around to that in a little bit. I just want to tell a few stories, though, uh, tell you a little bit more about my, myself. Uh, I, I think it's important. I always get a little concerned talking in front of a board. So to the Board of Trustees, and I'll tell you why. I want to three of the four boards they have here at the Naval Academy. You probably didn't know that stuff. Huh? Uh, and you can probably guess which one I didn't go to. Uh, the first one was an academic board. Even though I went to that, by the way, I had an ASVAB waiver to get into NAPS. Um, uh, so I went to an academic board and flunked off the wrestling team freshman year. Um, and that's a story in and of itself, and we, and we could share that at a later time. Uh, I went to a conduct board. Uh, I'm glad the, the, the brigade of is not here for going over the wall. And getting, uh, but, but I'm still married to her 33 years later. Um, so I guess it's a win-win. Uh, and I went to a performance review board. And this was the first year in 1985. Cindy, you probably remember this. We had to take this comprehensive review. This was the high, remember, this is the high water mark, and I'm gonna to come to the near peer competition here in a moment. This is the high water mark of the, of the Cold War. And, you know, and we had a very uh, singular, singular threat in front of us with the Soviet Union. And a lot of the professional competence review was all the naval science pieces and all the, the art pieces of uh, navigation and all. And then there was a lot on the Soviet order of battle and how they would fight and the, 
and the uh, recognition of shapes, of silhouettes of ships and aircraft, and uh, um, you know, and how the how the how the fight would would materialize. Well, it was the night before we were wrestling Lehigh, and I, I was cutting some weight. I, this is my excuse now. I probably didn't study hard enough. Uh, and before, all you had to do was a pass fail. This is the first year if you didn't if if you failed or if you got a. Uh, a uh, certain grade, it was a 70 uh, or 72, I think, I forget how I scored. Um, you would, they were gonna do, get a, to what now I would call a summer session, but that's what then we called summer school. Uh, it was the first summer uh, here that I was not gonna have to go to summer school to make up for the, the, the hole I dug when I was a, a freshman for on the academic board uh, to, to uh, so I fell asleep during part of the exam, woke up, tried to rush through the answers, and I, I missed the, the, the review by uh, two points. And, and of course, I went to summer school, but I learned a lot about the Soviet Army. So uh, <laughs> in fact, every, every course I really liked here, I took twice. <laughs> uh, chemistry, and I got an, and most of the time, I got an A in it the second time. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a little bit of a slow learner, like repetition. Uh, believe it or not, naval history. I have another good excuse for that, but that, I don't want to steal the time. I want to save some time for some questions. But um, I, don't, I don't say that as a, as a badge of honor, uh, to be quite honest. I'm not, I'm not necessarily uh, proud of that. Um, I, I say it more as a scar of perseverance. Um, not only a scar of perseverance, but a recognition of others, coaches, faculty, teammates uh, that help you in, when you're when you're struggling. And you know, I, I think this institution is incredible in that, in that front. So uh, I start with that. But uh, a little bit of my background, I, I come from a large Polish-Irish family. My dad was a city fireman. I have eight brothers and sisters, uh, seven, seven boys in the family, two girls. I was a wrestler. Uh, my dad worked a few jobs to put us through uh, a, a Catholic high school um, with no expectation that they were gonna pay for college. Uh, wrestling, wrestling was, was, a, was a forte of mine, and it offered me an opportunity that opened doors that you know, maybe others didn't have, and similar siblings in my family. So I was the first one to go to college, and I was gonna make every opportunity uh, to succeed with what I opened up with, with the boards. Those folks, this institution, to invest in you, to have, that even when you're suffering, or when you're you're down, that they see, an opera, they see a chance and they take a chance on you. So uh, I owe you know, an awful amount, a lot of uh, um, thanks and gratitude uh, to this institution. Uh, 33 years, so I came here wrestling, naps, uh, we talked about that, I was a surface warfare officer first, and did a lateral transfer, um, and uh, as mentioned, the hallmark of, uh, the high water mark was, was the, of the Cold War and that, that Soviet threat. The other thing that I'm sure we still have them here, and I don't keep, I would like to keep up more than I do, but the Forrestal lectures. Again, I wasn't too interested in the Forrestal lectures, but then we used to you know, walk over to uh, Halsey Fieldhouse, and we lived on the other side of the world in Second Company, so it was a longer walk to and from, and uh, I was more interested when they had concerts there and when Huey Lewis in the news showed up. Uh, it was, uh, but, but, uh, it was a time to kind of rest and, and, and walk over with your friends and, and uh, hear some interesting uh, discussions. Two that really kind of were ingrained in my memory was Admiral Rickover, uh, the esteemed uh, Admiral Rickover, and, and uh, Ross Perot, uh, EDS. And, and I, he came and talked about the, the rescue before the, uh, the hostages were taken. There were some other hostages that were from his, the EDS, Electronic Data Service, uh, that he basically hired uh, retired Bull Simmons and, and they went in and, and basically rescued uh, his two employees. Uh, and it's about bold initiative uh, and, and opportunity. Uh, but with Admiral Rickover, it was really interesting. You know, I remember the clearest day, and I was happy with what he said. He, he was, we were terrified of Admiral Rickover uh, as midshipmen here. And, uh, and he thought that we shouldn't Sir, you probably remember this. He thought we should not have had sports programs here. 
and which I completely disagree with because nothing prepares you more uh, to go into harm's way than the as aspect of college athletics. It's the closest thing to combat under, under stress uh, that, you, that you, you can, if you can replicate or uh, that, that level of pressure and, and, and you know, fear of failure and that type of thing. Uh, and so sports, athletics here is important, I, my, my belief, my opinion. Uh, but Admiral Rick ever said there should only be two sports here, boxing and wrestling. And, and, and everything else should be about study and, and, uh, and but he was a war fighter. He had a war fighting focus and that was his mentality. And I, the reason I, I kind of start with that is because of the national, uh, the, um, the national defense strategy recently. Coming up this February, I think, will be the, a year since uh, the SECDEF posted the, uh, 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 signed out the national defense strategy. Uh, in the national defense strategy, it's important because I, just to talk about that for a moment, I still got two more stories for you, so I hope I don't, this is my part, this is my, piece of the forest all lecture, but it's the blue collar version, all right? So the, uh, the national defense strategy, really important, and, it, and, it, I'll, and I'm coming back to that in a moment because I really want to talk about where the CNO uh, has, has, get, has designed a plan uh, and, and, a, and, a, and a narrative for the Navy the nation needs. Um, and I think it's really important when you think about uh, the derivatives coming down from the national defense strategy down through his design for maintaining maritime superiority down to the Navy, the nation needs, and, and what, that really, what does that really mean? Um, so there's a couple things that are really important, and the, the national defense strategy for all the alum uh, that are here and, and the board, you can, it's an unclassed document. It's really concise, well written, uh, and, and it, there's some really strong language in there about, the, um, about our defense and our air interest. And so uh, it really talks to the threats, uh, the five threats that are out there. Uh, it talks about the strategic environment, the proliferation of technology, these threats, particularly the revanchist states of uh, Russia and China, but also the rogue states of North Korea and Iran. And then what we know is now is a common uh, threat from the last 17 years is violent extremist organizations. Um, so it kind of lays out this, but it doesn't just lay out those threats uh, like uh, defined by that. It really does lay out the strategic environment and, and the complexity and the uncertainty of that environment and what, how that's going to challenge us moving forward uh, as we move towards uh, near peer competition or near peer conflict. And um, it, it's really, really well written on how we have to transform. Uh, so then you come down one step from that uh, to, to uh, now, the CNO, like I said, well, I, I would tip my hand. Um, he was not going to be the guest speaker. Um, so the CNO was already thinking about this because the national military strategy released by the chairman had already been out for about a year. And it, and it was similar, but the, the national defense strategy kind of, uh, uh, you know, firmed that up a little, a little more crystal-like. Uh, crystal and so he had this, the, the design for maintaining maritime superiority. And he's got four color lines in there, four lines of effort, uh, if you will. Uh, the blue line for strength and naval power and the gold line for people, which is what I'm going to focus on here in a minute and come back to that. Uh, the green line on high velocity learning and training and synthetic training and those types of things. And then the purple line, which is about uh, partners and the partners we need. And you know, from a, from a special operator, uh, that really has been out of the Navy for a long time until I returned to, to Naval Special Warfare um, and, and the Naval component now at SOCOM. Um, there's the, the partner aspect is completely understood by special operations uh, because for the last 17 years, we've, we've relied heavily on partners uh, to, to help, you know, sure, we're, you know, part of the National Defense Strategy is to strengthen uh, our, those partnerships, but also to, to, to build new ones. Uh, you would be surprised the level of uh, sh intelligence sharing and things we're doing with uh, some non-traditional partners. Uh, the UAE comes to mind. Uh, and how good of a partner they have been in places you, you, you might not think, uh, in Africa and other places. Um, and and we're, as we look at the str strategic environment of the future and those five threats and where we need to transform uh, and have the Navy the nation needs, partners become really important. 
and uh, uh, we are not going to backslide on the maturity of building partnerships, not only at the at the our coalition partners, but also with our interagency multinational organization, that the whole gym uh, concept, if you will. Uh, those are those are not assumptions for the future operating environment. Those are actually we need to maintain that they're facts. Okay. So uh, the national military strategy designed for maintaining maritime superiority, and then the, the, the CNOs that, you know, building the nation, or the Navy the nation needs, and it's uh, five or six pillars in there. This aspect of a bigger fleet, you, you've, seen it, you've seen it in the press, 355 ship Navy, um, a modernized fleet uh, that the ships are capable of taking on the higher end threat. Uh, a, a netted fleet, so every sensor and every ship can talk to each other, and and and, a, and a bit because because it's about decision speed, and that's where particularly Russia and China were in a race on decision dominance. Um, tailored, that's the people aspect, the ready fleet, and for some reason the sixth one slipped in my mind. Cindy, a phone a friend, help me. Um, the, uh, uh, um, but the Navy has been a. a a tremendous partner to special operations over the last 17 years in the counterterrorism fight globally. Uh, and, and they, we have been, Michelle, you speak on much more forums, you, you, can, you can contest me when I come up here, but we have been winning the current fight. Uh, General Thomas would tell you there hasn't been a, other than homegrown uh, uh, and a, a very terrible uh, shooting today on the West Coast. but. Um, there hasn't been a homeland attack uh, from a foreign entity through violent extremist organizations, and that's, uh, I think it's a testament to the joint force and, as well as our interagency and, and foreign partners. But what we are doing and what we've been doing for the last 17 years in the current fight is not good enough to win at the next level when we, when we, we start to think about near-peer competition and, and uh, and or, and or contest. Now, in that near-peer contest, this, this strategic environment talks about the proliferation and the ease of, of uh, commercialization and, and the information environment and, and the availability of sophisticated uh, commercial technology that can, can contest uh, some of our symmetric, what have been typically been our symmetri symmetrical advantages. Uh, and that's, that curve for Russia and China where we may hold dominance is, is narrowing. Uh, and how do we maintain a tactical advantage, or excuse, even a strategic advantage, um, you know, as we as we look to compete below the threshold of conflict uh, with uh, with near peer? Um, so I, I I have a thesis, and uh, one I think the CNO uh, believes as well is that it's leadership, it's our people, it's the gold line. It's leadership development. Not only do we need to build the Navy the nation needs, implied in, as that, in that is that we need to build the leaders uh, that the Navy and the Marine Corps need uh, in, the, in the future competition or the expanded competitive space, if you will. Um, so uh, I'd like to just kind of stop there. Uh, NSM, Navy, nation. Uh, so. Uh, in, the national military, in the national defense strategy, describes the strategic environment we, and those five threats. We know in there it's described that the homeland is no longer a sanctuary for us. So there will be a constant level of tempo against the counterterrorism threat, the counter-violent uh, extremist organizations. And that's costed us a lot of money and time and strain uh, across, the, you know, across the Department of Defense. Uh, and, and the balance will be f figuring out how to maintain the, the pressure on that threat to contain it where it, where it lies and, and, and as an away game and, and transform the, the, the rest of DOD, particularly its, its uh, programs, uh, to be maintain their, our edge and weapon systems uh, as well as the you know, platforms. So in that constant tension between uh, resources uh, and, and a pretty pretty decent budget this year, uh, President's budget for uh, restoring readiness and also moving towards modernization, uh, we realize that the, the, the violent extremist fight is here to stay. Uh, we got to deal with it. Sanctuary is no longer physical. 
with the, the aspects of cyberspace and the aspects of how cyberspace can be used by violent extremist organizations or others um, in the way of influence, uh, in, in, inspiring, uh, in the way of um, uh, cyber currency, Bitcoin, they can, they can remain, that's the, in, in the old sort of counterinsurgency doctrine, if you take away sanctuary, you have to take away a couple things, and one of them is that external support. Well, there's an aspect of that external support is no longer uh, connected by roads and distance and geography uh, to that sanctuary. It's connect we're now connected globally by, you know, by the internet and, and cyberspace. And those are, as we think about the future of warfare, uh, the, not only the characters changing or reemerging in, in, in the case of, of Russia and, and China, uh, but the, the character of how we will fight is going to change, is changing as well. Um, so it's going to be important that uh, we develop the leaders that can contend with that, that can lead, lead us through that and win that fight. Uh, and and, I'm, and I, I want to tell two stories. Uh, one is about uh, my, my former aide, is Lieutenant he a graduate of the, United, the Naval Academy. Lieutenant Dan, I'll call him Lieutenant Dan. He just made Lieutenant Commander, so we can't call him Lieutenant Dan. He, and he's about, he's about 5'7", red hair, about 155 pounds, soaking wet. Uh, but this is the, the product that this institution puts out on the battlefield. When you, and you think about this, and, and I know I have a lot of uh, you know, military alum in, in, the, in the audience. You know, battles, battles, engagements, wars, and even in the future of this expanded competitive space, the gray zone, some call it, um, is and the complication in those areas are one at the O2, O3, E6, E7 level, right? So in Lieutenant Dan's case, uh, Lieutenant Dan was uh, West Coast SEAL Team Ford, working for Combined Joint Special Operations Task Force Iraq, and currently the Operation Inherent Resolve campaign. Uh, not this past summer, se September 17, or December 17, uh, the liberation of Mosul. Dan was really, we were operating under some, you know, some, I wouldn't say, some very clear guidance about how far forward we could go and what we could do in our advise and assist role. Uh, and, and our guys find opportunity to push those limits uh, to get the mission done. Uh, Lieutenant Dam was the, the main advisor to a number of the Iraqi generals of the counterterrorism service that actually liberated Mosul. Uh, so uh, the complexity of a young lieutenant who's dealing with these seasoned uh, Iraqi generals, a, a really uh, kind of weird uh, relationship with the Iranian Shia militia groups that are on the outskirts as well, dealing with the populace, dealing with the uh, the Iraqi government, dealing with the country team, uh, dealing with the local populace, uh, uh, dealing with his own guys that probably want to do more than they're allowed to do and being able to, to kind of lead, inspire that team and lead them through. But, you know, they pushed through uh, and really liberated the, you know, and, I, and to me, I, I know who won that. I know who won that battle. And I know what that means for, you know, the success of the, you know, the, 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 the recent elections and how much Dan played a role in that. And I also know, you, as you connect that dot back, how much that was from what he was taught here, um, what he learned here at this institution. So this is an incubator of leadership uh, here at the Naval Academy. And I think the Naval Academy, Soup, I think as we look forward, it's got to evolve as well. So, uh, you know, I joked about those boards. I graduated, uh, I graduated in the top 10% of the bottom half of the class. And... Uh, you know, we had five seal billets uh, the, the year I graduated. Um, uh, I, I like to believe I was the sixth, the, the first alternate. But that only makes you feel good as I went out to uh, become a you know, surface warfare officer uh, and then transfer, you know, later transfer. But I think that the, the institution here, and there's many vectors of success at this place, whether you're, you're part of the masqueraders, whether you're an athlete, whether you're involved, I was a midshipman in ranks. Um, the whether you're you know you're an academic all-star, uh, there's many vectors that can get you there. And, and you know failure, setbacks at this place aren't final. 
They're, they're really not. Uh, no is not always terminal, you know, and adversity is not the end of the end of the world. And that we got to understand, you know, these these kids that are coming to us today, and you can describe it much better than I can, um, are digital natives, and really where we need to go with the future the Navy the nation needs and the leaders that the the nation leads uh, is really understanding uh, how we can accelerate. Uh, the, the knee and the curve here for human capital investment uh, on how, because these leaders are going to be, the, the things that their Lieutenant Dan are going to be asked to do are, are even, even much greater. Uh, the complexity of wh what they're going to have to balance as a young leader, and it's coming out of the gate as soon as they come out of here. Uh, as soon as they graduate for, f as a type commander f of Naval Special Warfare, as soon as they graduate from Naval, or excuse me, BUDS, we can throw them right into the fight. They come out ready. It's a two-year. It's a two-year, you know, process. It's a long process. We invest a lot in them, just like we invest a lot, like what was invested in me here for for five plus years of my undergrad. Um, the it it's just important that this place continues to grow and challenge our our students uh, academically, uh, morally, um, um, you know physically, uh, because the, the, the fight is going to be much more complex and harder. And the battles in that space are going to be the, are going to be defined. But what is that I believe we retain back to my thesis that we retain the the um, symmetrical advantage or asymmetrical advantage in our people, it's our leaders. And it's not just our leaders are also leaders that come out of uh, the Naval Academy uh, as these heroes sit over here that uh, you know, once all enlisted now, uh, commissioned warrant officers. Uh, and this, that brings me to the second story, because to kind of put a, put a punctuation point on, or an exclamation point on, on the story, uh, our most recent Medal of Honor recipient, uh, Britt Slabinski, uh, retired Master Chief, and his uh, battle, his uh, leadership under some really harrowing conditions in March of the third the night of March 3rd, 4th, 2002, in the battle for Roberts Ridge. Uh, you, can, you can find it online, you can read the story, uh, but basically they, they go through a lot of bad planning and a lot of bad uh, in, you know, intelligence preparation of the battlefield and a need to, to kind of go in and support the, the overall Operation Anaconda effort, which, by the way, was a, a success, which is not known too well in the story, uh, and supported the conventional forces and the 101st that were uh, in the valley there, Shelly Wally Cot. So as they're coming in on top of Takagar at 9,500, 10,000 feet, um, they, they, they take some fire. And the, it's a magic bullet that hits the, it hits the electric or the hydraulic system in the, in the uh, aircraft, uh, the CH-47, and the pilots are now f basically flying on manual without the hydraulic piece. They're jacking it around, but there's hydraulic fuel uh, uh, running all around the, the deck there. And, and Neil Roberts, an Air Force combat control, um, and f falls out of the aircraft. Actually, the guy, one of the crew, was tethered in, slips and falls. He looks like he's fallen because they were getting ready to air land, and we get out and come out really fast and, and, and you know, take up a tactical position. Uh, um, uh, Fifi, Neil Roberts, jumps up to, to grab uh, the air crewman that uh, was slipping out of the back, and actually, because of the way the helicopter jolt, Fifi falls out. The, the, the CH-47 uh, goes up the Shalakaliwat Valley, uh, the, the name of the mountain is Takargar, uh, about 15 kilometers, and we've lost complete situational awareness at the, at the command and control level. Uh, and and um, then Senior Chief Britt Slavinsky, um, you know, takes it upon himself, this is, uh, uh, takes it upon himself sitting in the back of that helicopter to take his small team, no officers on board, to take his small team in to return and go rescue Neil Roberts. Well, 24 hours later, uh, they run into the jaws of the enemy at, at 10,000 feet, fighting uphill uh, to, um, I'm sorry, I called Neil the CCT. It's, it's Chapman who, who later dies, who was the CCT. Neil was, was one of the uh, SEALs. Um, crash, they, they get up there, they get so close, they get, we, we see it later in overhead uh, imagery that they get Almost on because of the snow is about waist deep. They get about three meters from uh, from from Neil. Uh, that him and so Britt Slabinski in with the hills like this. Britt Slabinski 
and Chapman, the Air Force CCT, are here, and they're taking heavy fire. So they're, they're firing. Um, one of their, two of their guys get shot or, uh, pretty, pretty badly, Turbo, uh, who's, who's lost his leg, uh, and, and Morgani, who was, was shot in the leg. And they're realizing they're, they're, they're losing this fight. Uh, and and we, we already have two QRFs inbound uh, to, to go and recover, help recover the team and, and save uh, Neil Roberts and recover the rest of the team. And uh, the, the, the first QRF gets schwacked coming in pretty hard. We lose a, a, a you know, significant number of uh, Army aviators, Rangers, uh, uh, another Air Force. Um, third time coming in on the top of this hill, you know, kind of not really recommend it. Uh, so they're fighting off the hill as the QRF's coming in, but they're now they're, they're, they're jumping down the side of this mountain. Uh, and they're, they got two guys that are, one's bleeding out uh, in his leg. They're, they're, they're triaging the medical piece. They're fighting. He's still calling, for, uh, doing calls for fire. At one point, he, he sends his own coordinates, almost calls fire in on himself. Uh, the enemy's mortaring from the other, other nearby mountain ranges, and they fight for about eight hours going down this mountain. And we eventually affect a link up uh, and so with some more heroics uh, that I could go into much more detail. Um, but it, when, when you listen to Britt Slabinski and, 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 uh, and the, his decision to you know, go back to rescue his teammate, he, he was an Eagle Scout. And he talks about when he's in the back of that aircraft, and, he, and he's, he's, how can he draw strength? And, and he's, you know, they've just been shot up. Neil's, Neil's back there. We don't have no idea what's happened with Neil. There's injured pilots uh, that, that have crashed. The pilot that's in that ha aircraft, that when the aircraft comes to rescue them, he t kicks the pilot out. He, he's the pilot that's going to go back with Britt Slabinski, uh, the, the original pilot that went in. Uh, take them in. But Britt's sitting in the back of the aircraft and, and trying to, to, you know, look strong in front of his teammates, inspire your teammates, uh, you know, to the, to, for your mission. And uh, all, that's, all that's running through his head is, on my honor, I'll do my best. Over and over and over again. And it's, it's you know, quite moving. Um, so, Oh, I can ask. I was hoping the midshipmen were here. This, this, this call to serve, dare to lead. The call to serve. We all, we're all called to serve. This, this dare to lead. It, it's not. It's not a social, a social media gimmick. It's not the ice bucket challenge. It's an enduring principle of this institution. Dare to lead. It's our charge to these young officers, these young enlisted, about the future and, and their responsibility as a leader. So I, I want to thank you for the time. I'm willing to stay and take some questions. I, it went pretty long, but uh, I'll take some, a few questions. And I just want to thank the board, the trustees. You did make me a little anxious initially. And everyone, and it just, it's been a, my honor to be here and, and to address you this afternoon. Thank you. Questions, please. My name is Spencer Johnson, sir. I'm an old retired Navy captain, class of 63. I was born in 62. <laughs> in 1996, shortly after retiring from the Navy, I was working on a project for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff with an Army colonel, my contemporary from West Point, a great friend. And we were to answer a question from the chairman, which was, what should the National Unified Command look like in 2010? And we suggested a number of changes to the chairman and the JCS. Number one, we said somebody has to be in charge of America. Mm. And we got Northern Command. Somebody has to be in charge of Africa, and we now have Africa Command. We said, we have to address the challenge of cyber warfare. And we divided it into two parts, 
defense and offense. We said the defensive part of cyber warfare ought to go to Northern Command because there would be intensive coordination with the civilian industrial complex involved. And we thought that cyber attack ought to go to Special Operations Command, primarily because of their ability to do the type of targeting that would be required. Uh, and of course, that didn't happen. I'm not sure exactly where our command organization is for Cyber Command, or even if we have answered a lot of the principal questions still outstanding like, what constitutes an act of war in cyber warfare? So if you could address those in just 30 seconds, sir, I'd appreciate it. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm going to phone a friend. I'm going to make a, a feeble attempt to answer that, or, or at least give you some observations on it or some judgments that I, that I have seen in my role as the Assistant Commanding General at the Joint Special Operations Command, my time at Naval Special Warfare, and, and you have an expert on that topic right here because it's an aspect of, uh, there's an aspect of policy and authorities that are, that are absolutely involved there. Uh, SOCOM is notorious, is that the, the right word? Uh, famous, notorious would, would maybe have a negative connotation, uh, for changing policy by con ops. Uh, particularly uh, in the areas that we are described militarily now as ODTAC or outside the, the active theaters of conflict. Um, and that, that's some of those uncertainty pieces. Again, I got 100 stories of Lieutenant Dan's in, in these ODTAC env environments that are happening every day right now. But specifically to your point about cyber, and I, I'm pretty passionate about cyber uh, because to me it's a, it, there's a strategic aspect for sure. Uh, but more importantly, we need to be, our enemy is being more bold in that space th that's described in, in the national defense strategy. And we're not, we're not, we're not, we're seeding that, my opinion, not as the deputy SOCOM commander, uh, um, we're, we have, we're somewhat seeding some of that space. And if we're going to lose advantage, uh, you know, in our weapons systems, we might be losing, seeding some space and, and gain, or giving some ground, uh, uh, you know, metaphorically, giving some ground in, that, in, the, in the cyberspace. It's in, absolutely critical to your point that our industrial base, that our, our weapon systems, that our nuclear deterrence works under attack. So defense is really important. And as I've told uh, Naval Special Warfare to I'm blue in the face, I get really, one thing that is a pet peeve of mine, first is drugs, uh, and the second is uh, um, cyber defense. And when, when we get lazy, about operational expedience uh, to take shortcuts in cyber that make us vulnerable. Uh, it's, it's, our, our cyber security has to be built on defense first because our, our, our command and control architecture, our weapons all have to work under attack. But we absolutely have to be in that space tactically uh, you know, to find, uh, to surveil. And there's a strategic aspect of understanding foreign intelligence and all that. But we need to be in that space because it's, 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 it's going to be one of the warfighting principles of fires, if you will. Uh, and we need offensive cyber operations in support of uh, everything we're doing out there, uh, from the soft operator uh, to, you know, to the O5 captain uh, on a ship out there. He needs the, those types of uh, authorities and tools uh, to be able to compete in that space and the challenge, whether it's messaging, but really for us at a tactical, uh, very specific effect, short in nature, that is not gonna have a strategic fallout that damages third world partners, cripples hospitals, those types of things. And some of that's been hard to describe to uh, c Congress, uh, but Paul Nakasone as the Cybercom commander is doing an incredible job. There's a new uh, national security, what's, what are the new presidential directives called, uh, uh, on, on uh, military action in this space that's uh, pretty, uh, uh, pretty uh, uh, lean, or, you know, allows us a lot, lot more space than we had only a year ago uh, to compete in that space. Uh, so I, I, I echo everything you're, you, you've just kind of laid out on where we need to be. I don't know if it needs to be at SOCOM. We need the support. We probably, SOCOM, can be a, an aspect to help cyber-enabled operations. Uh, going forward, you know, for the services, particularly in the near-peer fight. Uh, but those are kind of my 
I don't know if I really got at your question, but. Uh... Uh, you did, sir, but I would just like to add uh, that I think we owe a great debt to Admiral Carter and to others because this is the first institution in the country that is producing graduates that will be 100% schooled in cyber warfare. Yeah, I'm pretty parochial about this. I think the Navy's leading that across the board, to be quite honest, with the digital warfare officer and office and the things that uh, Nancy Horton previously was doing. And uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a, they're, they're digital natives. We need to be in that space. And this is the involvement I was talking about this institution needs to take. So very, very great vision, sir. Thank you. Did you see an awful lot of the fleet, and um, you know, we're, we have a great institution here, and the foundation, and particularly the campaign that's ongoing, really amazed me how much of a level of excellence that the foundation and, and that the Alumni Association provides for the Naval Academy. So many things that we have at this great institution, you know, when we work here. Yeah. But as you see Naval Academy ensigns coming out to the fleet and joining the SEAL team, how are they doing in terms of whole person? And do you see anything we need to be focusing on as we look forward to the future? Incredible. That's a good. That's a good question. And I, and I was uh, uh, kind of trying to bait the soup prior to coming in here with this distinguished body of guys over here. And I, and I'll give you guys the microphone. Who wants to answer that question? I, I think I would start with character. I, I think if there's one thing we've recognized in our formation, uh, character counts, and it counts for a great deal. And uh, I look at this institution, we're fortunate enough to be up here this week to, to do some work, and uh, I think it's the character you develop in, in those young officers that come to us that matter the most. And it's that character that leads us in the future and produces uh, admirals like uh, Admiral Schmansky. Excuse me. Um, so for us, I would say character is, is probably paramount. Um, obviously, there, there's, there's other aspects, the willingness to compete, that combative, if you will, uh, nature that, that we get out of those guys, those, those are all aspects I think are, uh, are important to us. Yeah, if I had had more time, I, I had the two, the two uh, themes of the uh, CNO's uh, Navy Leadership Development Framework, the competence character interconnection there, but also this, and I, I didn't bring it out of the National Defense Strategy, this imperative from, from the SecDef on, the, on urgency. Uh, on, on transformation and the urgency required uh, to re this aspect of uh, uh, of character that uh, that's listed well that's articulated really well in there and it's in the sect that absolutely understands that my thesis I stole it from him uh, on where battles are won is this aspect of bold initiative and, and so I and I, I, I kind of tried to end with that uh, with this dare to lead uh, because it's not gimmicky and there's a lot of times, and, and we, we've seen some of this maybe coming out of the comprehensive review um, on, on training qualifications and standards. We, we've got to be look at risk more through a, a opportunity of not acting. And deterrence in the future, in the gray matter, it's the cognitive space. The, we tend to be very cautious over here. This space is this wide. The Chinese and Russians are over here in numbers of this. And, and there's, there's a lot of room for deterrence uh, at a tactical level of initiative uh, when, when, when you hear the SECDEF talk about bold initiative. So this, this character aspect of what's coming out here, we need to uh, keep them hungry uh, about and understand bold initiative. And, and we'll learn the competence piece with reps. They'll fail, uh, but the systems we have in place to, to, to train these guys allow for that competence failure. Uh, what we want to really understand is that when it comes time and the bold initiative and the judgment pieces of decision making, that their that, that they're, they're clar you know, clarity of thought uh, in, that, in that moment. Afternoon, sir. Uh, Vikram Kanth. I'm a 2015 grad, still lieutenant junior grade. Uh, I had a question for that's, you about... That's 85 uh, plus what, 20? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, uh, 85 plus nothing is the same thing, math, sir. Math and public. Uh, I had a question about bold initiative as it, as it goes to word cyber. What does that look like to you in your perspective as a bold initiative to cyber? Uh, I'd, I'd like to say thank you to <laughs> Admiral Carter on the whole preparing me for yeah. a cyber for a cyber focused job. So I'm just curious, what does that look like to you, sir? Um, I think it's taking on an aspect of the messaging. 
I think there's more we can do in social media. It, today, you know, the, you can go back and fact check me. I know the fact checking is big in the media these days on the, the boards that I went to. I'm not lying to you or my class standing. I'm, I'm not sure I really remember the number, but um, so to, to this, your point, there's a more, much more we can do in social media to, to challenge. And we've got a pretty good uh, first stab at that with the web ops down under CENTCOM uh, that's doing some pretty good work in that space. But uh, it took a long time. It took way too long to get there. And so I think we need some reps uh, at a lower end of bold initiative in cyber to show success in that we're not going to bring down the national infrastructure. We're not going to put our third, you know, our other party partners where systems run through their, it, you know, this whole aspect of sovereign territory and where things run through when it's linked. Uh, th those, are real, those are real issues that we have to take on. But when we can show that we can do things in there without, uh, that aren't reckless uh, and that are having a strategic effect, because uh, we, we've got a race on the messaging, particularly on the violent extremist organization piece. Uh, but also just think about what the Russians are, have done in the elections and, and, and getting the word out on uh, things like civilian. I mean, to the enemy, it doesn't matter, particularly the violent extremist organizations. It's it, who gets the message out there first, whether it's truthful or not. And so I think there's more in the way of messaging and speed. But there is an aspect, when I say boldness, that as we move towards tactical operations that have to be really deconflicted through our interagency partners, the intelligence community. Uh, but we can make some small steps and get some, you know, success begets success, get some small wins and, and show that the, it, that, that the world's not flat in cyber, um, that, you know, we can, we can go beyond. So uh, I don't know if that gets at your question or not, but that's how I feel. Sounds great. So thank you very much. All right. Yeah. Do we have one down here? Thanks, Greg. Hey, Tim Byron Marchand, Class 78 CEO. Thanks for coming Thanks. through, first of all. And you're not a stunt man in our view. We appreciate uh, all that you do and very proud to have you here. One of the things uh, we're doing with the soup and with this foundation board is investing in the future of what the next horizon looks like. Two horizons that are constants is one is we're investing in international cultural awareness and immersion. And I hear you talking about the soft skills of being a warfighter, so I'd love to get your views on how you weight that, that characteristic among your warfighters, the ability to work with other cultures. The other is robotics and leveraging technology in the battlefield or in any warfare environment. And I know in the world that you're in, there's a lot of techno technological leverage. So we're, we're dealing with asymmetric threats. People use drones, don't give a damn. They'll, they'll drop chemical weapons, don't give a damn. Just wondering how you view the future of the academy in these two areas, leveraging technology and robotics and, and cultural awareness. I, I think they're, they're not linear in the, on a spectrum, if you will. They are sort of opposite poles when you think about technology and, and w how that may accelerate the war fighting functions and the decision dominance and that speed. Uh, but the other reality on the other end of that is, and, and, and the use of SOC formation, the uh, Army Special Operations Command, uh, very focused, you know, in unconventional warfare and foreign internal defense. But, but we've been doing that for years in, in, in naval special warfare uh, since Vietnam, to be quite honest. I, we, do, we don't do anything currently uh, out from, a, from a soft lens. And I think the CNO has a similar view uh, through a partner lens with, with uh, you know, restoring global maneuver and, and the leveraging of partners. Um, is that the culture piece becomes real important. I gave you the example of Lieutenant Dan, and, and you know, he's fighting you know, basically a proxy force uh, to clear Mosul, to restore you know, the, the, the security for uh, that nation, but really managing that at the O3 level. Uh, everything we're doing you know, in, in, in Syria and Iraq and uh, what we've been doing in Afghanistan forever, um, you know, particularly again through a soft lens and the Afghan Special Security Forces, is all about developing, having that cultural awareness and that, that we would call it under, you know, this chairman's uh, multi-domain, multi-dimensional uh, sort of future fight, that that's a, that's a huge aspect. It's almost its own, and this gets debated in doctrine, it's its own dimension, the human terrain, if you will. Uh, but we, it's imperative to us. Uh, we. The things we're doing in Africa are all by, with, and through. And it, you only get by, with, and through if you establish trust with those, those folks. And trust means being with them. Uh, and that's why it's always a little you know, awkward on the unaccompanied advise and assist and those things where 
you know, when you bleed together and you fight together, you win together, you die together, uh, there, there's a lot that, that builds. There's no better way to build and trust. Uh, you can't really just go in there and tell them and ask them to do, do your bidding if you're not willing to show some skin in the game. And uh, That's a very raw answer, uh, but I think those two dimensions of what this, uh, the Evolve, where the Academy needs to go is right on the right path in both of those areas, absolutely. Um, you talked about the persistence of the counterterrorism mission. That's not mm -hmm. going away, even as the strategy shifts you towards strategic competition. So what, when you look at how uh, special operations forces, not only Navy but broadly, have been focused in the last many years, and now the broader range of missions that you may have to support vis-a-vis -vis, you know, uh, deterring China or Russia or, God forbid, you know, actually being in some kind of conflict, what are the, the mission sets or the, the areas where you have to sort of rebuild expertise and experience and capacity that you haven't had to really focus on in recent years? Yeah, no, it's a great, great question, Michelle. Thank you. Um, I did a lot of thinking of this and, and almost, I tried to redesign Naval Special Warfare here recently under force optimization to, to, to address what, exactly what you're talking about. Um, we will have to, uh, you know, uh, as the Australian became an American, State CT, uh, writes all the books on counterinsurgency. Uh, Kill Cullen talks about being able to, you know, stand on the head of the dragon, basically the CT feet piece, and, and spar with the dragon, uh, basically the higher end adversary threat. Uh, we're, we're no, so not only has the enemy and the high end enemy seen the way that special operations and, and to a larger extent DOD has fought for the last 17 years. That's the way the services have seen, our own blue force has seen us fight. And so we often, uh, often in, in those kind of higher level meetings, um, they look at soft and they go, you're just gonna do the CT piece. Uh, I spent a lot of time, and I, and I think uh, bringing at least NSW back to the Navy about the future piece, that we've gotta be more compatible because I think much like they have supported us in the CT fight, uh, as we move to, let's say, a high-end you know, scenario uh, against, and I know the CNO hates the term, the anti-access, uh, anti-denial, we believe we have some, some capabilities and some skills to uh, help uh, you know, prepare for and compete below the, the threshold of, of conflict. Um, what we, we do have to reform. We have to we, at the same time that we're still holding on the, on the VEO fight, we've got to change the rest of the organization to some of the skills that we once had uh, that we maybe not have had as many reps in. Uh, but there is an aspect of the, the concept of how we'll fight in support of, uh, of, the, of the services, particularly the fleets for, for NSW. Um, I think there's things that we just talked about in cyber that, that you know, an, an aspect of access. Um, so there's this, uh, we are transforming too, uh, in, but part of that's transforming our narrative because really the rest of the world, including some, so in some days even the Secretary of Defense sees us through that CT lens uh, and doesn't realize, you know, the roles we have in countering weapons of mass destruction, which will be a, you know, if the, if the Korea scenario went up, that we'd be on short order uh, to maintain a, a CVO footprint and posture and be able to respond to, to help recover or render safe, uh, you know, weapons of, interdict weapons of mass destruction. I think we've learned a lot in the way of speed and decision making, and under the former administration with the, the, the strikes and the high level of strikes, that, that was good for us. We learned a lot uh, about uh, fidelity and intelligence and the way of uh, speed and, and sensor integration that I think we could help um, uh, the services. I believe uh, Naval Special Warfare and the rest of SOF could be pathfinders in the way of human machine teaming for the future. Uh, not necessarily on the X, but close to the X to enable something for the services. Uh, so we're, we've got a full, we've got a full court press. And I'm in my new role, uh, one of the, uh, maybe a peak under the tent, uh, General Thomas has, has tasked me with is we've got all the components out there, service components of the soft, doing something a little bit different, maybe related, and he just wants to harness that a little bit tighter in an experimental force. So uh, cut it out of the GSOS and, and actually put it on a concept with a mission and a purpose at the end of this that's seven years out, past the fit up about the future fight and how we might, what, what need, still needs to be, you know, soft, unique's role to that, to that fight. Um, I don't know if, uh, does that hit it? Okay. 
again, it's been my, my tremendous pleasure and to be the stand-in. And uh, I, hopefully I was uh, at least entertaining. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Well, thank you very much, sir. I, I would say on behalf of our, our very esteemed audience here and Byron Marchant, the president of our Alumni Association, I dare to say on behalf of our 60,000 living alumni that are out there fighting the good fight, thank you for your 33 years of service, what you've done for this country and what you'll continue to do. And uh, we have a very small token of our appreciation with a the ball lawyers. cup. It's less than $20. It's ethical. <laughs> Thanks, sir. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much.